Welcome to this week in the world of wrestling. Welcome to Twit Wow, the best wrestling podcast made for wrestling fans by wrestling fans on the web today. I am John, alongside my cohort and commentary Ashton, and this is our Monday Night Raw review. And I'm going to keep this short and sweet, guys. Personally, I did not care too much for this Raw. In fact, for me... This Raw would have been better titled Raw is S.H.I.E.L.D. because anything that I found interesting from this Raw came directly from the former S.H.I.E.L.D. members, Seth Rollins, Roman Reigns, and Dean Ambrose. Everything else in between, I'm not going to lie, I just didn't find that compelling tonight. Ashton, what did you think? I am so glad that you said it because I was thinking very similar. I wasn't necessarily going to go with the Raw is S.H.I.E.L.D. angle, but yeah, this Raw to me was... The cookie cutterist of cookie cutter. It was actually kind of obnoxious. I'm so glad it wasn't me because I was beginning to think like when we were reaching the 10, 10, 30, well, maybe it's me. Maybe I'm just in a foul mood, but I just was not clicking with this raw. But the reason why I did go that route is, again, for my money, I felt like anything involving Roman Reigns, anything involving Seth Rollins, anything involving Dean Ambrose, I was invested in. And And you know what, dude? To me... As exciting as everything Roman Reigns was tonight, they managed to make it uncool by the end of the show. You think so? Interesting, interesting. I I don't know if I'd go that far, but I'm glad you and I do have similar sentiments overall. So let's just transition right into our first segment, Heat of the Night. And I don't have any Heats of the Night tonight. Again, it was just a blah raw for me. So what about you, though, Ashton? Do you have any uh, hot complaints? My friend, I have a full roster of three. Oh, this has been a long time. Wow, a full roster. You know what? And I'll probably co-sign on to most of them, knowing me. So let's get to the first one. What's your first complaint, dude? My first complaint is, you know how you said Raw is S.H.I.E.L.D.? Well, I'm going to say Raw is formulaic because everything about this Raw fits some kind of formula It was completely cookie cutter. It was like they were on autopilot and not even trying. So this Raw for you really was that joke that we used to, you know, pawn to King for. Just, you, know, you just go through the motions, so to speak, just to fill the three hours. Yeah, I mean, it really it really was. It felt like the writing team was just like, ah, uh, it's Canada. No matter what we do, it's going to get a reaction. Just put anything out there you want. And again, you know, it, it was weird because there were some things like not involving – you know, Ambrose, Rollins, or Reigns that, you know, I did enjoy, like, like uh, the Wyatt Family versus the Usos tag match. I thought that was a solid tag match. And honestly, I have to give WWE credit for having two separate Diva storylines intersect in the same match with the deteriorating Funkadactyls and the surprisingly cohesive uh, AJ Lee and, and, and Paige, you know, with the whole Divas title debacle going on. But outside of that, and even that really couldn't keep my interest for too long, just, just for certain reasons, so I guess we'll get into later. But yeah, I, I really do have to agree with you. Nothing really jumped out at me with any of the booking tonight, and I don't fault Toronto at all. I thought Toronto was a great crowd, but I think it's exactly what you said, Ash, and I think that we're banking on them being a great crowd, so they didn't put their best foot forward. Right. Um, honestly, I just realized that one of my three heats of the night is invalid because it had to do with Divas, but I'm going to throw it out there anyway. The the little brawl that happened between Naomi and Cameron looked like something that you would see on World Star Online. It was really pathetic. You know, I, I really can't add anything to that. I Really, for me, I thought it was what it was. The idea that Cameron still has a job. And really, if there wasn't an uproar, Emma would have been out of one. I, I think it's absolutely disgraceful. But, uh, you know, that's just me. I don't really think she adds anything to the product. Sad thing is, I really could see her, at least in WWE's eyes, getting one of those top female heel roles. I don't know. Maybe I'm wrong. It's just she's so easy to dislike. We've proven it week in and week out. I was happy Naomi really asserted herself. But, yeah, let's just have the match, have them go their separate ways, and let's get to Naomi's hopefully star-studded career because uh, I really do have uh, high hopes for her. Right, and you know what? I think most people that pay attention to the product do have high hopes for her, but this brawl that they they had after their match, <sighs> I mean, the hair pulling and the random wild punches being thrown, it honestly looked like a few of those punches were stiff, which isn't a good thing because 
you don't want like if they dislike each other, you don't really want them working with each other because you don't want either one of them to get hurt. I mean, I know that there are probably some people out there that hate Cameron enough to not mind if she would get hurt, but at the end of the day, you don't want anybody working for the WWE to actually get hurt. Well, of course not. I mean, that that's a PR nightmare, and, and regardless of how you feel about a person professionally, personally, anybody that gets hurt on the job, you know, is awful. Uh, right. You know, it's, it's an awful thing to happen. I mean, I, I've been very critical of Santino Moroa, you know, the, the professional, the character. But when I heard that he suffered his third neck injury, you know, this past week, that's awful, especially because yeah. there's a lot of neck problems going around. I mean, look, look at Daniel Bryan. You know, so you want to create the safest possible working environment. So I completely agree with you on that front. To me, I think my problem with it, since we are kind of just running away with this and kind of breaking our own rule for a change, I just felt like it went on too long. I just feel like if Cameron had just slapped her and walked off and then had Naomi stew as the babyface and then we get our match, that would have been a much more effective selling point. But you kind of belabored that a little bit when it when it just dragged on and on. I just want them to have their battleground match and just be done with it because I really just have no interest in this feud. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, you pretty much said it. So um, as far as my, I guess, technically second heat of the night, because again, with the no divas rule, um, my second heat of the night is just kind of a general blanket statement, missed opportunities. Because uh, you started the night out hot with Harper and Rowan finally picking up a win. But then randomly, Alicia Fox versus Nikki Bella. Apparently, John Cena can come out to save any baby face on the roster. But when it comes to his own freaking fiance or girlfriend or whatever she is, nope. This honestly didn't even surprise me, though, because I don't know. First of all, like, I, I was going to make a joke, but I guess being serious about this, I guess they don't want to acknowledge too much in the WWE universe. You know, you and I even complained about this a few weeks ago, how they're, you know, I guess they have a difficulty between cross-promoting the Total Divas universe with the WWE, you know, product universe and Raw and SmackDown, and then other times they want to keep it separate. It's like, make up your mind, and this is yet another blatant case here. I mean, Nikki Bella... I don't even know what happened out there. It was a stupid concept that didn't even follow through. You know what? To me, it really is a shame at this time that Tamina is injured because she could be the female muscle of the authority, and they could have done this exact same match but actually taken it seriously, and you could have had Tamina destroy her. So it's really uh, sad that she's out with a knee injury uh, currently because, you know, Alicia Fox, while I like her, um, this was not the place for those antics. If she really wanted to be crazy, why don't you channel that in a ridiculous beatdown in the sense that, wow, she really beat her up. Right. Uh, you know, the point is to feel sympathy for Nikki so we can rally behind Brie for when she returns and actually make the Bellas likable, a mountain that I thought was just uh, insurmountable at one point in time. But you can see Brie turning the tide. I don't know if Nikki ever will. And this is also yet another discussion that you and I have had, you know, in the archives. Uh, and we and we just don't think it's manageable. I thought this segment was a waste, and you know I I say that more freely now because I have faith in the women on the roster. I can I can see an upturn in the quality of the division. So you know I, I'm just being honest. I didn't think this deserved a spot on TV, and I and I feel like you could have delivered a far more effective message had you just approached it differently. I I like the whole tormenting Nikki uh, Bella angle because of what it's ultimately leading to. But this was one way of getting there that I just did not agree with. Right. But again, the whole the whole theme here is missed opportunity. John Cena was nowhere to be found later on in the night. Uh, Dolph Ziggler versus Alberto Del Rio. To me, the missed opportunity to hear is why in the world would Michael Cole during this match announce that the winner would face Sheamus for the U.S. title? Have this match go on so that we can at least attempt to suspend our disbelief about the potential that Ziggler might win. And then when the match is over, a couple segments later, make the announcement. Because of Del Rio's big win over Dolph Ziggler tonight, he'll be facing Sheamus for the U.S. title tomorrow night on main event. The fact that Cole announced that the winner of this match would get that title shot while the match was going on completely took me out of the match because I knew that, okay, well, that means Del Rio's winning. I don't care anymore. Very true. I think I think you make a great point. I mean, for me, that was, that nail in the coffin was already kind of placed when Fandango's presence was made. No, because I'm thinking, oh man, shenanigans are going to go down. But even that aside, I think your criticism still stands because it all comes down to pacing. You know, right. pacing how you deliver things, pacing how you set things up. 
I think it would have been far more effective and made the match um, seem, you know, more worthwhile and, and make the win for Del Rio seem more hard, hard fought if uh, he finds out later that he was looking at a United States Championship opportunity and the fact that Del Rio won again and we're going to get on main event pretty much the exact same match that we got just this last Smackdown, Smackdown yeah. which honestly, dude, if, if I had one heat of the night or, or a complaint, and I hate to cut in while, while you're on your roll after I already said I didn't have any, Del Rio getting another championship opportunity against Sheamus really shows me that while we have an exceptional roster right now, maybe there's more of a dearth in the mid card than I than I first realized because I thought we were pretty. Well, rich that's in the pro- the problem, dude, is that you have a main event talent holding a mid card championship, so it wouldn't be believable for any actual mid carders to beat him. Right, right. So the WWE basically has to just kind of look on the roster and figure out who's in the main event but not actually in the main event. And basically the answer kind of comes down to RVD, Cesaro, and Del Rio. And those are the, pretty much the only guys that are going to be facing Sheamus until he loses the belt. Yeah, I, I hate to say it, but you really do make a great case there. So, you know, I just wanted to get that off my chest. But I do, I do agree with you about the missed opportunities. I, I think pacing on commentary. Oh, I'm not done. I'm not oh, yeah. done. Oh, yeah. What, what was another one that you got? Let's keep this going. Another missed opportunity, and there were actually about three in this segment. First of all, and this is the, the Bret Hart segment that I'm referring to. First of all, why in the world would Damian Sandow come out as another Bret Hart when the most told-about legitimate shoot rivalry, arguably in wrestling history, is between Shawn Michaels and Bret Hart? Could you imagine the amount of heat that Sandow would have garnered if Sexy Boy would have hit on the Titan Tron? I mean, seriously, that is a missed opportunity. I completely agree with you. It kind of boggled my mind, too. I mean, I hate that Sandow is doing this to begin with, but if you're going to do it, do it intelligently. And that was kind of like, I mean, it was like neon signs kind of pointing you in that direction. And you're just like, eh, I don't think I'm going to. I don't want to go down this path, just be another Bret Hart. So... While the segment, I mean, at least for me, it had its comical moments, but it really lost the punch that it could have packed had it been Shawn Michaels. Because the things that he said while he was portraying Bret Hart would have been so much better if he was Shawn Michaels right. or, or or Shawn McSandow. I, I don't know. Um, you know, whatever the case may be. Sean you know, Sandow's. Sean Sandow's, yeah. It, it's just, oh, you know, pretending that uh, didn't tap out and that the bell rang too quick and this and that. Like, Shawn Michaels is always known for his cockiness and his arrogance, so statements like that would have been perfect for a guy yeah. uh, interpreting Shawn Michaels. So I completely agree with you. Yet another missed opportunity. And another one is Damian Sandow got knocked out by one punch from a 60-year-old. Are you kidding me? I mean, to me, the missed opportunity here is why didn't Sandow get back up and at least act like he was going to attack Bret Hart? And then, since we know now that he was going into a match immediately after this segment, have his opponent come down to save Bret Hart and get into the match that way. That at least makes Sandow looks like, look like he's somewhat tough. And plus, he gets the the coward heat because he's going after a 60-year-old. This is something I've always hated about WWE mentality. Uh, again, if I could just build off your point. Uh, I've always hated how they show this uh, this deference uh, to the legends. I, I get that everybody that's kind of laid the groundwork for everything deserves a certain you know modicum of respect. That That's not to be disputed. But And I know you and I don't care for The Miz, But it still got in my crawl that when he was getting his reign started as WWE Champion, one of his earliest defenses was a TLC match against a 60-something-year-old Jerry Lawler. Yeah. And it took interference from Alex Riley and Michael Cole for Miz to defeat an elderly, pretty much a commentator, you know, in Jerry Lawler. It's ridiculous. No matter how you and I feel about a particular superstar, and I know we don't care for Miz, and I'm still a fan of Sandow, and I think you are too, it doesn't change the fact that when there's such an age disparity – you want to talk about suspending disbelief, you're pretty much making my dis- disbelief cry out in agony. Like, stop stretching me so much. You're, you're really taking your liberties when you expect me to believe that a Bret Hart is going to hit Sandow in the face and he's not even going to attempt to get any kind of uh, revenge or, or vengeance or what have you. And it would have made Sheamus look great, as you said, making the save in freaking Toronto. Um, I, I just I don't get it, man. I completely agree with you on all fronts. Yeah, and finally, my 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 third missed opportunity in this segment is Damian Sandow's opponent. Because why in the world does it make sense for Sheamus, a generic 
Irish former main eventer to come out to save Bret Hart. I mean, really, what sense does this make? To me, it should have been a Canadian. And to be perfectly honest, yeah, I had myself hyped up for a Sami Zayn debut. But regardless, it could have been any Canadian. Since NXT and WWE have separate kayfabe universes, let Tyson Kidd come out and get a freaking rub. I don't even care, but it should have been a Canadian to come out to save Bret Hart. Definitely, you know, build on that. Uh, you and I both, well, well, you especially. I, I was really wary, but I, w- I was starting to buy into it towards the end. That, oh, man, what a great uh, way this would be to debut Sami Zayn and the pop that he'd get. Even if you wanted to swap out opponents, because really, I'll just say this right now, and this won't be my formal review, but Jericho Miz really wasn't anything special. And honestly, considering how they got started, maybe they should have built more of a story and just had their match at Battleground, so we feel more tantalized about getting a Jericho Bray Wyatt for SummerSlam, and uh, you could have had uh, Jericho Sandow, you know, tonight, and that could have been Jericho, because Jericho's just building on this momentum, coming back as a babyface, it would have been a cool moment, and, you know, Jericho would have gotten the win, obviously, uh, but I, I agree with you, you know, Sheamus is Irish, he doesn't have that hometown connection, it just seems like, and it's funny, Ashton, it's funny, because you describe this Raw as very cookie-cutter, you know, you know, very basic mentality booking, you know, A to B, B to C, but I, I feel like even if that were entirely true, at least they'd have the competence to take advantage of these things. So, right. so it's almost like, yeah, it was that type of booking, but almost with, with a certain done absence poorly. of competence. Yeah, done poorly, absolutely. Okay, my next missed opportunity was Paige and AJ teaming up and not having any friction between them because apparently all the focus needs to be on the Total Divas. I'm torn on this one. I, I can definitely see where you're coming from. But honestly, the idea that Paige hasn't plunged the dagger yet only entices my intrigue. Maybe I'm in the minority on this. I'd like to know what our viewers think. If maybe they're more with you or they're with me. Because whenever a um, Paige is going to strike, I'm thinking that they're going to make it not necessarily mean something, but I, I think it's definitely going to get more attention than you're used to women getting on the product. Uh, so I actually really like that they were a cohesive unit and that Paige is seemingly playing this long con because she's, she's just got to be steaming internally and I just can't really wait to see that unleashed but I, I can definitely see where you're coming from and that's it uh, just a lot of missed opportunities tonight I kind of group all of those in under one umbrella for my heat of the night so there you go uh, wasn't that only two, though? Didn't you say you had a full roster of three? Well, yeah, I did say I had a full roster of three, but I also told you that I realized that I, I one of them was right, technically right. disqualified because it was the Divas thing. 